Um, so that's the situation now in uh, in Belgium. Uh, I think most of you also know that it's quite a polarized debate, uh, which we hope to overcome today. Uh, so <laughs> um, we have five people with different expertises that are not so prominent in the debate so far, or well, some of them more than others. Um, so we have uh, a legal scholar, uh, Elodie de Korte. Uh, we have an ethics scholar, Michiel de Proost. Um, we have uh, a philosophy and adoption studies scholar, <laughs> a long name, uh, Sophie Wittax, and then uh, the organizer of today, uh, Tine Klaas, a historian, and then online, uh, you can see Astrid Indeke, uh, psychologist. Um, also important to mention, you will notice that there are no stakeholders on the table at the table here, only academics. So that's a bit the setup uh, that we have today in the Humanities um, Academy or the Humanities. Um, uh, what's it called, the health humanities uh, events. Uh, but of course, that doesn't mean that we don't want stakeholder engagement. So if there are people in the room or at home uh, who are stakeholders, who are donor conceived persons or people working in fertility clinics, then we would very, would very much like to have um, inter, uh, interaction and conversation with you. There will be time for that um, towards the end. Um, I think those were the main things uh, to mention uh, uh, content-wise. Um, also, just shortly, how will we organize this or manage this? So we asked all of our participants to prepare one statement uh, that they are that they want to see discussed today. Um, they will present their statement, or I will present the statement uh, for each one of them, uh, and then. If everything is okay, the people in the room will have three color cards, a red one, a green one, and an orange one. So the idea is we propose the statement or we mention the statement, then you rise um, a color to say, I agree, which is green, I disagree, which is red, or I'm not sure, which is orange. Uh, don't be afraid to use the orange ones, because as I said, we want to go beyond polarization. <laughs> Um, at home, we notice so you can have you can have also a green or a red uh, re re reply. So if you look at the reactions uh, button, um, there isn't an orange one, um, but there is this little man that looks a bit surprised. <laughs> so if you use that icon for orange, uh, then we will understand. Um, I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Uh, Dina is showing it, but I'm not sure if the people at home can see it. Um, so after your votes, we will have the person who brought the statement give you an explanation of how they think about this statement, uh, and then we will have a panel debate about the statement. Each uh, statement will only take 15 minutes, which reminds me that I have to get out my phone so that I can strictly time each statement so that we're sure to get to the last statement and that we will still have time for interaction. Um, I hope I didn't forget to say anything. Uh, so we'll start by introducing uh, the people here, and perhaps we can start with Astrid uh, at home. Um, we asked uh, the panel members to introduce themselves based on three uh, questions. Uh, one is, who are you? Uh, the second, why do you think you were invited to participate in this round table? And then finally, why have you accepted this invitation? So I'll give the word to you, uh, Astrid. Hello to everyone, I'm Astrid Dindeke. I'm a psychologist, a clinical psychologist and researcher. And I've been working in the field of donor conception for 15 years now, uh, looking at the experiences of parents, donor conceived um, people and donors. And um, why I'm here today um, is I think the topic of donor anonymity does raise a lot of questions for um, all those involved. And to my experience is also a lot of disinformation um, in the debate, which causes uh, even more um, questions and concerns. And so I thought that's why I would contribute. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elin, I'm gonna move to you. Uh, Elodie, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> ah yeah, the microphone. Is on that side. So hello, uh, good afternoon. So I am Elodie de Korte and I did a uh, PhD about the rights of um, children of donor conceived persons to know their genetic origins, specifically in the context of medically assisted reproduction. And I defended that PhD uh, last year. Um, so yeah, I think that's why I, uh, I'm very glad to be a part of this, to uh, bring in the legal perspective with all the um, other perspectives. So yeah. Thank you. And then Michiel, our ethicist. 
Yeah, so um, I'm an ethicist, I think, yeah, and um, I have a background so in also in reproductive ethics. So I did my PhD, uh, the same as LOD. I defended it last year, but at the Free University of Brussels on the topic of uh, egg freezing. And uh, during my PhD, I did some interviews uh, with women who are who were interested in egg freezing, and there uh, the, uh, the team of uh, donor anonymity popped up. Uh, sometimes, so that's one of the reasons why I'm interested also in, in this uh, debate. And the reason why I think I am invited is also a little bit personal because uh, I know Tina already for uh, some time because we were together in uh, the board of SOFIA, which is the Belgium uh, Network of, of Gender Studies. So there is also a, a personal interest, I think, why I'm here. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Yes, good afternoon. Um, so I'm uh, Sophie Witax. I'm a professor in philosophy at uh, Maastricht University. Before I was at uh, Vrije Universiteit Brussel with Michiel. Um, I'm uh, currently working on uh, adoption and uh, more specifically from an ethical and philosophical perspective, examining the ethical dilemmas that uh, pose itself in adoption and uh, also thinking about adoption from the terms of uh, how do we normatively think about the human being and then how uh, do adoptees become excluded from what we conceive to be an, a normal human being. Um, so I'm uh, here and I've accepted <laughs> because uh, I think there's a lot of uh, similarities. There are also differences, of course, it's not all the same, but there are a lot of similarities uh, regarding the questions uh, of identity that uh, pose itself both in a uh, 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 donor conception and uh, in adoption. Uh, adoptees and uh, donor children also find themselves often uh, in struggling for their uh, rights of information. So I think it's uh, very important also that as researchers we uh, get a bit closer together. And uh, yeah, I'm also an adoptee myself, uh, domestically adopted. Um, that uh, explains a bit the personal interest uh, for me to engage in this debate. But I also want to emphasize that I'm also a researcher so I find it important also to see which kind of arguments from philosophy and from ethics we can find, which kind of values to uh, discuss about these issues. Thank you. And finally, Tine. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Tine Klaas and um, I invited myself to this <laughs> round table. Um, and actually the, the whole point of, of organizing this, I, I wrote a book on the history of the sperm bank. It was published uh, last year um, in Dutch. And when writing this book, I came across um, yeah, expertise from so many disciplines, um, which is not always very present in uh, political or societal debates. And with this event, I wanted to bring um, these, yeah, I wanted to give a forum to this um, other forms of, uh, of expertise. So here we are. Yeah, thank you. Um, I suggest that for the, uh, the quotes, we start on, in the other direction so that we start with you, uh, Tina. And the, the quote that Tina brought is, uh, donor anonymity is out of date. So if you agree that it is out of date, you can rise, raise um, a green uh, flag. If you don't agree, red. And if you're in doubt, orange. I can see on, ah, no, we can't vote, but you can explain it during the conversation. In the room, I see green and orange. I don't see red. And online, I see one red and mainly green, I think. I oh, know, two reds. Uh, so apparently, there's a majority for green and some people in doubt. Uh, so I'll give the words to Tina um, to give some historical insights into this question. Why donor anonymity might or might not be out of date. Yeah, thank you, Hedy. Um, I uh, propose the, the statement donor anonymity is out of date because, of course, I am a historian and you could say that this is a historical um, statement. So um, let's unpack it. Um, what does it mean for something to be out of date? According to um, the Cambridge Dictionary, which, of course, is a very authoritative uh, source, uh, laws, beliefs or systems are out of date when they are no longer considered to be correct or useful. Um, because they do not reflect more recent changes or developments. So if I, as a cultural historian, want to know if donor anonymity is out of date, I think I would first need to know what the past logic behind it was. And then I would need to compare this, these historical beliefs to our contemporary um, beliefs and values. 
So to shed light on the past logic behind donor anonymity, I'd like to quote Leon Herman Levy, who was um, a pioneering fertility doctor who already began to offer donor insemination in the 1950s. At the time, this was uh, something very progressive. So he wrote, and I quote, the whole point of donor insemination is that the child that is conceived in this way considers himself and is considered by others to be the own child of this man and that woman, unquote. So in other words, the whole idea was that the infertile husband had to pretend to be the biological father of the child. No one could know about the use of a sperm donor, not family members, not friends, and definitely not um, the child. Within this larger system of secrecy, sperm donation was often compared to a blood transfusion. So sperm was uh, considered to be a technicality. It was biological matter without much social uh, significance. Who the sperm donor was um, did not really matter as long as his physical characteristics were close enough to those of the receiver. Fertility doctors mainly emphasized um, the importance of the social fatherhood of the infertile husband. They considered nurture to be more important than nature. And quite a few doctors even believed um, that the donor parents um, would forget that the child was not biologically um, theirs. Now, um, historically, donor insemination has always been quite a controversial treatment, but as a historian, I find it interesting to see that the arguments used against it um, have changed a lot over time. So, for example, in the 1950s, um, critics of donor insemination mainly referred to religious or moral arguments. And in the 1970s, um, you can then see um, that there is more importance attached to um, the yeah, trust and transparency in child-parent relationship, which then begins to become more important. And donor anonymity only really became a subject of debate in the 1980s, mainly under the influence of two developments. Firstly, there was more debate about adoption, um, which we will um, discuss later. And secondly, and DNA gained importance after the invention of DNA fingerprinting in 1984. And this technique for the first time made it possible to determine uh, paternity relationships um, with 99% uh, certainty. And both in reporting on adoption and DNA, I find it fascinating to see that the new concept um, began to matter. And this concept was identity. And actually, um, in older criticisms of um, donor conception, um, identity um, never was um, an argument or it was a marginal um, argument. But today, it is an omnipresent um, concept. So since the 1980s, many people have come to believe that who we are, our identity is linked to genetics. Uh, and you can see that this right to identity and the right to have information about genetic background is also very present in the activism of donor conceived persons. Um, so let's return to the statement, is donor anonymity out of date? As a historian, I would say it is, because it does not reflect recent societal changes. If you look at the arguments of pioneering fertility doctors who installed this system, then we would no longer be convinced um, by these arguments, or very few of us would um, still um, understand this logic. Um, donor anonymity is opposed to newer cultural ideas about the importance of genetics uh, and identity, which have um, yeah, developed in the last 40 years. Okay, thank you. Are there any members of the panel who would like to respond to this uh, quote or this statement? Yeah, go ahead, Sophie. Yes, yeah, I, I basically agree. <laughs> but uh, well, now. Yeah, or maybe two remarks uh, that I uh, want to make. Um, when you say that uh, only in the 1980s it became a topic of discussion, I think what you forget is that it also became a topic of discussion because those uh, donor children came of age. And that was the same with adoption uh, at that moment. So uh, uh, before the narrative was determined by particular types of actors who had, of course, their views and their arguments. And so you see that narrative changing uh, from the moment these children are able, these adults now are able to also voice their own perspective. So obviously then you get uh, other types of concerns uh, that are brought in the discussion. 
Uh, so hence, I also uh, situate uh, the importance of identity that uh, becomes discussed uh, then that was just ignored before. And in a way, I also think that thinking about identity in biological terms is not that new. I think it's actually age old okay, in terms of DNA, of course, that is very new. But I think the biological narrative is a very ancient one and a very um, dominant one in our society. A very important one for many people, whether you believe it's true or not, um, but it is there, it has been there for a long while, and so it's an important source for people to um, build their identity, and therefore, um, but I will come back to that later, <laughs> I think we cannot just dismiss it as uh, unimportant. Yeah. Can I perhaps ask a question? Do you mean if it, uh, this argument of identity, is that mainly referring then to knowing that you are donor conceived so that you can build an identity uh, knowing that you are donor conceived or also very specifically to the identity of the donor? So for example, thinking about the, the new advice now, would it be sufficient if you have information about the donor but not the identity itself or wouldn't that be enough to fulfill this criterion for identity? I, I will answer to this question from a historical perspective because I think it's, it's quite interesting to see that this um, secrecy um, becomes controversial a lot earlier than anonymity. Mm. Um, if you look at it um, historically, um, so from the beginning, secrecy is actually contested um, because it is seen as something immoral to do. Whereas um, identity, even though I believe that this idea of biological identity is, of course, very ancient, I don't see it um, popping up in discussions about the donor conception much before the 1980s. So I think there is a cultural shift, which is, I also agree, um, influenced by uh, adopted persons and donor conceived persons coming of age. Um, but you can see in the 1980s that this is a new um, concept which becomes very central um, in debates about donor conception and which um, remain uh, very present today. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, um, this is, in my view, a historical change, which says something about our culture as well. Yeah. Do any other panel members want to interrupt? Mm -hmm. yeah. A question because, um, as you said, you think that donor concept anonymity is out of date, and I also agree. But how do you reconcile reconcile the fact that it's now out of date, but the donor conceived persons that were conceived in a time where it was not out of date, um, and for them now it's important? How do you reconcile this this past and this present um, from a historical point of view? I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I can't reconcile um, parents with their children because basically then it, it comes down uh, to this. What I did try to do with when writing the book um, is to shed light on these past logics um, in order to make it easier to understand um, the past sensitivities and the past emotional uh, cultures. Um, because I think um, there are big generational differences in how we think about identity and how we think about, um, yeah, also handling emotions, um, being transparent with children, um, yes or no. Um, so what I try to do, um, I don't know if, 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 if this answers the questions of reconciling, but I try to... Um, make it easier to understand um, different generations by also having different perspectives um, in the book, both from older and younger uh, generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was also wondering if you saw a distinction between uh, different cultures, because of course we are not one culture um, and there are still people who prefer donor anonymity. So would it be is it an argument against making anonymity mandatory or an argument against all kinds of anonymity, also voluntary anonymity? I don't think I completely understand the question. So it, within society, um, I think there is a clear shift towards finding identity more mm -hmm. important, and, um, but not everybody is in the same place in that trajector trajectory, right? So there are uh, people and com communities also specifically where 
where there isn't so much openness. Um, so how, how I, well, did you find any yeah. differences there in your research? Well, my, um, my study was about Belgium, so I find it quite hard to, um, to answer, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, of course, if you would look at, I mean, if, if you would now go to a fertility clinic in Brussels, you would have people from different backgrounds with, mm -hmm. you know, different um, ideas. But I, yeah, I, I don't feel secure enough to give um, a very clear uh, reply to this, but I do think that there is a cultural factor in um, the way we think about identity and the way we think about donor conception. So the history I have written about Belgium um, certainly does not apply uh, yeah. to, uh, to other contexts. No, yeah, okay. I'm also wondering if Astrid, if you want to um, interject something, please do. <laughs> yes, I had um, one question to um to tina um as we were talking about identity and of course that's a a large word with a lot of it covers a lot um and i was wondering i was thinking about identity about ancestry about genetics and the reason is because you refer to dna in the fingerprinting that is now since the 80s possible to uh to do the paternity testing but genetics is has become much more in several fields genetics has changed um or become more or less important um so i was wondering what you thought how that might impact it for example the huge popularity of ancestry online um, people searching for genetic ancestries um how do you see that development as well yeah I I think it's a good question because I think, I mean, also, for example, contemporary hobby, which is very popular, is, is genealogy. So um, really studying your ancestry. Uh, and I think these are um, also linked to our present day um, fascination with the concept of, um, of identity. Um, so I think you can see this in, in several branches of society, also in several um, debates. Um, so I, um, yeah, and I think this is also to some extent new. So for example, what I also find interesting um, when DNA uh, fingerprinting is invented, um, it gradually begins to, um, yeah, begins to challenge older ideas about fatherhood and paternity. Um, so yeah, you, you can see this in a lot of legal traditions as well, and Elodie will maybe uh, talk about this as well. But in a lot of legal systems, the father was for a long time defined as um, the man who was married to the mother. Um, so it was more of a social definition of fatherhood and not so much a biological definition of fatherhood, even though there were, um, I mean, definitely also ideas about blood relationships. The legal principle was social. Um, and you can see that this becomes more problematic um, in later decades because the institution of marriage also becomes more uncertain. Um, so also when it comes to determining uh, child-parent relationships, genetics um, begins to play a larger role because a lot of the, the thing that used to give you know, structure to, um, to social relationships are not as certain anymore. Um, so yeah, yeah these... This uh, is linked with, um, yeah, and with that's big developments. our time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said it was going to be strict, so <laughs> yeah. we're going to move on to our next uh, statement. Yeah, um, I think I will just follow uh, the line and go to um, uh, to Sophie, if that's uh, okay with you, Sophie. Um, so the statement uh, that Sophie brought for us today um, is uh, uh, perhaps a bit provocative, I don't know. It's a bit turned, twisted differently than how the statement is usually put. Uh, the statement is, your identity is yours and nobody has the right to take it away. Okay. So if you agree with the statement, uh, then you can raise a green uh, card. If you do not agree, red. And if you're in doubt, orange. Your identity is yours. Nobody has the right to take it away. <laughs> Again, I see a lot of green in the room, a little bit of orange. And online, I see uh, also green and orange. I don't see any red. So, uh, the heel is red. <laughs> so, you'll be... Uh, 
a good discussion then for, for this question. Uh, okay, I'll give the word to Sophie uh, to give your insights. Yes, um, I'll try to explain it in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I formulated the statement like that indeed because I wanted to reverse the question. I think uh, there's also a problem um, with the way that um, donor children are conceived, produced, um, and are then the ones who have to justify the right uh, to ask for information. And I think uh, what we do when we just take it as a state of affairs, that there are people who do not have uh, access to this information, uh, that we forget how these people have actually been produced in that way. And that there's a lot of steps, a lot of institu institutionalization, laws, actors, um, taking deliberate steps to conceal this information. This does not just happen um, naturally. Um, and so I think that the actual question should be what gives people the right to conceal this information. Um, the identity question, of course, is a big one, but uh, I think in a very minimalist way, if we think about biological facts, uh, the way you have been co conceived, the gametes that uh, make you as a person, uh, the womb in which, in which you have uh, developed, these are facts about a person, no matter which importance you attach uh, to that. It might mean not a lot to you, it might mean a lot to many people. Um, but the fact remains that what gives you the right to just conceal that? Yeah? So if somebody steals my pen from me, this pen does not mean anything to me. <laughs> but I think we all agree that you can just not take that away. Why would you do that? Um, so there needs to be some justification. And indeed, these actors do give justifications um, for um, what they do. Um, and these are both justifications that I take uh, issue with. So one is uh, the statement that Michiel here will be uh, defending, I think, that uh, <laughs> biology is uh, overvalued, um, which is an argument that is selectively used against donor children, but then not against the prospective parents who go a long way to make a child of their own, preferably using their own material, or if all fails, then adoption is often the last option. But even then, then a lot of effort goes in legally making that child your own. So for prospective parents, it's kind of accepted that they want the child of their own. But when donor children come actually with the same motivations, asking to get access to people they believe are their own in a certain way, no matter how they see that relationship, um, they are actively being prevented from uh, accessing that. So I think there's uh, a problem there. I also think there's a problem of uh, denying autonomy to people to, uh, to decide themselves on uh, how they want to give meaning to their identity. Um, we actually create two categories of people. Uh, we create people who do not have access to uh, this information because uh, yeah, there's a whole system around that preventing that. And then there are people who just have that. Um, so there's also a kind of inequality that gets created and uh, a lot of uh, frustration and anger among um, donor conceived people and adoptees comes from this sense of injustice. Why is denied to me what everybody else just has? So there's a fundamental uh, inequality there. Um, and then other arguments that are often invoked to um, justify why information is taken away are very utilitarian in the sense of looking at how can this benefit certain categories of people. And again, we see that uh, is the prospective parents who are prioritized. Um, so the argument is often like, uh, okay, when we uh, allow or we disable anonymity, then there will not be enough donors and then there will be so many people um, grieving uh, because uh, of not having children. And that's a grief that we uh, recognize and that we, yeah, we want to do something to help those people, which is understandable. But at the same time, what we do is again, subordinating children's rights to the needs of uh, uh, those parents. Um, it's very quickly assumed that there's no harm involved. Yeah? There's often a reference to statistics showing well, but these children do well. Um, indeed, they often do well, luckily. Yeah? So they often are okay in school, they have friends, etc. cetera. Um, but such surveys capture much less the sense of injustice that you carry, the kind of pain uh, that you carry with you. And then paradoxically, there's a kind of pain that we do recognize for parents. I can imagine that you do surveys among parents who did not manage to get children and who continue their life. We will probably see in surveys that they also do well, but still, we will still recognize that uh, there's a grief there and there's maybe even a sense of injustice. And again, that will be recognized, but uh, it will not be used against them as it is used uh, against um, 
the children. Um, so for me, both of these arguments to justify a right to take information away from people uh, fail uh, precisely because um, we subordinate the rights of the children, the needs of the children to the rights of the parents. And from an ethical perspective, I find that uh, very problematic. I think that uh, um, all parties should be involved in uh, ethical problems and especially the most vulnerable. Um, those children are vulnerable because yeah, sometimes they're not even born yet. So of course they cannot participate in the discussion. So it makes it very easy to decide without them. Um, when they are minor, they cannot, of course, uh, voice their opinions. Um, there are often issues of loyalty, genuine love also towards parents. You do not want to hurt them. Um, many children just keep silent about it. So I think parents might think that their children do well, but you actually don't know. I would not be too sure about that. Uh, we often see also with adoptees that uh, they only start talking about that at a much later age when they have children of their own, sometimes even only when the parents have died, because then they feel like, okay, now I can finally voice these conflicting emotions. Uh, so there's a delay. And in a way we make abuse of that delay by not taking their perspective into account. Although I think that uh, that excuse does not longer hold because uh, those people are there, they speak, we know uh, the problems, we know the issues. So uh, I don't think it's, uh, um, yeah justifiable to, uh, to keep them excluded from the conversation. Um, and so taking into, into account uh, values that I think we all agree with, uh, the value of autonomy, uh, the value of not treating a person as a means to fulfill another person's needs. Um, I think these are principles that are very important in our society uh, for the sake of these values. Um, I think there's no uh, way to justify that you can just take this information away. Yeah, thank you. That was a very clear answer to the to the statement. Does anyone on the panel want to react? I see Michiel is eager. <laughs> uh, yeah, first of all, I think we're on the same page in a certain way. But uh, if I look at your statement, like your identity is yours, nobody has the right to take it away. I find in a way a very problematic framing, like that there is something like an, an individual identity. It's like more... The whole right discourse that is also used a lot that's used a lot in the adoption uh, in the adoption and also in the donor anonymity debate is i think um, ethically not defendable for me because i see identity as something relational and if you say we need to to look at injustice this is also a relational aspect and i agree with you that we need to look at those injustices instead of uh, fighting for our own rights i don't think that's the way forward uh, so what do you think of that i'm not sure if i completely <laughs> get it but um let me reply I, if you say i see identity as relational i do too uh, <laughs> so that's precisely why i think it's important to recognize um adoptees and donor children as individuals uh, who we should communicate with and who we should take seriously as um, human beings who can take decisions or who we have to give the opportunity to make decisions for their own. I see this as pivotal in the parent-child relationship. I think there's a problem when you start a relationship with your child, which is shrouded in, sh in secrecy and starts with lies and concealing information. So I think it can only enhance uh, the identity, uh, the, the relationship between parents and children when you are clear and transparent about it. And when a child does not have to grow up thinking there's something wrong here. What are they holding back uh, from me? So I completely agree that identity is relational and I don't think it's just an individual effort or not at all something egoistic, not at all. Um, but this has to do with uh, how we relate to others. And um, up until now, those voices of the children have been ignored. So if you take identity relational seriously, <laughs> then try to relate to the children. Yeah, yeah, but, but, I, but I agree with that. But for me, as you said, like, yeah, it's, it's related also to autonomy. And again, for me, I look at very, I look with my philosophical lens to it, but, but what is autonomy? Is it just making decisions, um, individual decisions? No, I would see it more and it's very abstract, more and theoretical, but it's again, something relational. So I'm, I want to shift the debate to that direction instead of always claiming your own rights. I think it's not very productive 
And especially if we want to fight for social justice, I think we need to, to refocus it instead of, no? <laughs> uh, Does anyone else want to, or, or Sophie, if you want to react, yeah, go ahead. Very short, but social <laughs> yeah. justice is about uh, taking seriously the perspectives of all the people involved. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's my uh, understanding of it. <laughs> Maybe somebody else wants to uh, reply. Now. Yeah, I'm also looking at. Uh, if if I can ask uh, a question, does your uh, argumentation imply that we sh that we can conceal the identity until age 16 or 18, or should the child know? From the start, who the person is, the donor, because I can imagine, uh, yeah, that the argumentation would also go for smaller children and perhaps even more. There, also looking at the lens of identity formation, that it might be more difficult if somebody drops into your life at age 18 than if he or, or she was always, always there. Mm. Well, I think that will depend very much on the situation. Yeah? So you have situations where uh, the donor is somebody familiar, uh, somebody who's already in the, those people's lives in order the distance may be greater. So depending on that can also see how to deal differently with it. Uh, I personally think that children can handle a lot in that sense and maybe much more than we might think. Um, I would not see any problem in just being open uh, to that from, from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but I can also understand yeah, why people would find it uh, important or maybe for those particular children um, better to wait uh, uh, with it. So yeah. Um, uh, I don't have very strong ideas on that, although I think, well, let's just, if this is our society now, well, this is how it is, and uh, that should not be a problem. Let's just be open about that. Yeah. Um, children know very well who are the parents who care for them, who are there every day for them, who love them, and they are also very well capable, I think, to understand that, uh, okay, but this is the person who donated the exile for me, and the person is not in my life, but I just know who it is. And that's, I think that creates a kind of comfort that you just know that you also know that, uh, okay, when I have a question, I can just ask. I don't have to feel yeah. ashamed or feel bad. Um, so yeah, I think it's it could be perfectly possible to do that from a, a very young age even. Yeah. Does anyone else want to react on the statement that you're ident- Ah, I see Astrid wants to react. Um, yes, on the question that you asked about the age, I think there was, um, um, there was recently, um, just a research done in the Netherlands on the age limits um, in uh, the donor conception access to donor information, um, where the government asked what is actually the grounding for 16 and uh, 12 and 16 in the Netherlands, 12 for non-identifying information and 16 for identifying information. I know it's looked at from a legal, uh, psychological and an ethical perspective, and it is um, actually there is no facts ground that you can say 12 and 16 is the best age. Um, there are presumptions made. And I think if you, um, especially if you, if you want to say it's important for identity development and looking from a psychological point of view, 16 is a very old um, age, especially 12 when there is very limited information um, like um, blue eyes, short hair, um, stuff like that is very little to to form a little bit of a more um, information for your identity. Um, I think it all depends on, and that's to me why identity is relational in the sense that you form or build your identity in relation with other people, meaning that as well donors, as parents, um, as donor conceived people need to interact and together you kind of you build and develop the identity and as Sophie said um, I think it's very important that children do really know the difference between the parent and although I know a donor is a biological parent as well that's how you're taught at school I, I think there's sometimes words we are short of words um, but they know the parent who's raising them, who's taking care of them, and the genetic parent, which is their, they got their genetic um, parts from, call it that way. Um, and so in that way, I wanted to add to the identity that is relational. It is built or created in relation with and together with. So having a very polarized parents against donor conceived uh, or against their children or donors will not be from a psychological point of view, very 
um, productive way at looking at it. Yeah, thank you for those insights. Uh, and I think we have to move to the next uh, statement. So we'll move to Michiel. Um, the statement that uh, Michiel brought for us is, a person will suffer when she's not raised by her genetic parents. So if you think that a person suffers when they are not raised by their genetic parents, just raise the red, uh, the green <laughs> uh, paper. And if you think that they will not suffer, then the red one or orange one, if you are in doubt. This time I see a lot of red um, in the room and also online. I do see some uh, orange and green, uh, but also definitely more red than before. So um, a mixed room for you, uh, Michiel. So what is your view? I'm happy this? to see that. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's interesting and we can debate about it. Um, so what I... Uh, it, it's, it's going to be maybe a little bit chaotic, but it's also chaotic in my head. So I, I started with the idea, like uh, I have a background in philosophy, as, as, as Hadi said. So an anonymous donor, uh, we can see it as a kind of normative uh, category, like uh, it's implying certain a uh, certain value, like uh, it's the idea that we... Um, cannot uh, reveal uh, the identity of uh, the donor, so it ought to remain a secret. Now, uh, when we listened to uh, Tina's uh, story, um, I, I follow her in a way that she's saying like donor anonymity is uh, outdated. And I want to go further with that. Maybe it's outdated also as a normative category, especially if you look at uh, these direct-to-consumer genetic tests uh, that are um, available online with companies like 23 and me. Um, and, and then um, as a philosopher, as an ethicist, a moral philosopher, uh, it doesn't matter. That, uh, but in a way, I ask always the question, is this a positive thing? Uh, is this a good way to go forward? Um, uh, and as if I look to the history, um, I also agree with, with Sophie that there is really a lot of, that there, were, uh, there was a big injustice that the voices of donor-conceived people and also adoptees were not heard in the ethical debate. Um, uh, I'm a feminist uh, bioethicist, so um, I really like the idea that we need to give more attention uh, to the people who are marginalized and not just uh, think in a very abstract way above the people in an ivory tower. So I think it's good in a way that people have uh, access to this knowledge, as Sophie is uh, saying. But on the other hand, I'm also a little bit worried and concerned because when I listen to the stories of uh, donor-conceived people, I see some very problematic aspects around genetics and the idea of biological parenthood. Uh, and there, I think we need to be very careful uh, how we want to go further uh, with the debate. Um, so, and I was digging deeper in, in the literature because it's not my, my main expertise, donor anonymity, and, and a very uh, important voice in the debate is, for instance, uh, Hedo Pennings. And uh, it's, it's maybe controversial what he's saying, but he's emphasizing the importance of, of social uh, parenthood. And then on the other end, in the ethics debate, you have also people like Daniel Grohl, uh, for instance, who are arguing the other thing and who are saying li like, no, we need um, uh, no longer anonymity, but an, uh, an open uh, system. But if you read uh, Pennings and Grohl together, I think they also agree in a way. So I think it's not that uh, productive to only focus on what divides us, but uh, Pennings and Grohl also saying that we need to tackle the kind of geneticism, a thinking, a bias in favor of genetic relationships that we need to attack and criticize. And this is, I think, the most important message that I want to give. So I think it's important to re refocus and rephrase the debate a little bit. And that's also the reason why I took this statement and not including some, not included something about donations specifically. But I think it's important, especially from a social justice lens, uh, to look at broader uh, social mechanisms and social ideologies that are important um, and that are, are, are that we can use uh, for this debate. And uh, when I was preparing for this, I came across a very good book that I could recommend uh, to everyone from Sally Hesslinger. She's a feminist philosopher. Uh, she also adopted 
uh, uh, Chad. And she's also saying the same thing as me in a way that we need to take more effort to disrupt this whole hegemonic idea that we have like a nuclear uh, family and this is that this is the main uh, building block of our uh, society so and to end with a positive note so i said like okay in these testimonials of donor conceived people there is a lot of essentialism genetic essentialism happening but i also see other voices even uh, uh, with the donor conceived uh, uh, children so i just want to read uh, one of them uh, who's saying like with each choice to con we each choice to construct our identities in different ways some people embrace identity through their families and through their biological ties for some identity is constructed solely from a cultural group affiliation or from other non-blood relationships for many more, it's a combination of both. And I think this is a beautiful quote, who is in a way defending that we need to search for more pluralistic ideas of what is um, a good family in our uh, current society. So that is it. So I hope it was not too chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michiel. Uh, does anybody like to reply uh, or give their own views on the statement that whether or not people suffer if they are not raised by their genetic um, parents. Maybe I just have a question about what do you think then about um, donation of sperm and ochites in general? Maybe it will be more um, easy if we just forbid it all, um, or I don't know what you think about. Uh, I'm not in favor of forbidding anything. So, but I think we need just we can use uh, reproductive technology in a very productive way, maybe to create a certain a certain kind of. Um, resistance and, and search for newer forms of family and i think that's a way to go forward in the debate so it's may we can use these technologies for the better not for the worse if i so, so yeah so i'm not in favor of abandoning uh, donor uh, sperm donation or something like that uh, i think we should use it in a good way yeah ah astrid also wants to say something well i'm I'm wondering actually where does genetic determination is coming from because I don't see it in the research in the sense that I see a lot of both that indeed don't conceive um, people are searching for um, their genetic ancestry information and what it means and how it can um, complete their um, narrative or their life story but actually I haven't met anyone neither in research or haven't read I mean, I've, I've been reading so many stories about now. Here is a really good book. Oh, you don't see it with blurry. Sorry, Brave New blurry. Humans from, from a journalist. And I've just got another one who discovered at a later age that they their dad was not their biological or genetic dad. And yes, they searched for the donor. And they were just trying how to incorporate these genetic connections, information, into the existing one it's not either or it seems to, to to become always this either or and i haven't met anyone who was either or i haven't met anyone who run off to their donor and kind of completely abolished their donor or or social mother um and i think and and um in the same way is that there is so interesting experiences and beautiful described experiences of people who found their donor or the donor who met their donor conceived um the, the offspring that were uh, conceived by their donation how to give meaning social meaning to this genetic connection it's not directly that all of them say it's my um dad or family maybe it's related or further family or i see it as friends or acquaintances and, and I think that's what we should look at much more is how people give meaning to genetics then. And I think when you have been denied being able to express that this information is of interest to you, the harder you are denied this information, the harder you will shout to, to try to explain to people that, you know, this is an important part of me as well with the other parts um yeah sorry just wanted to add that can i, yeah. can Thank I you, follow astrid. up on? yeah you can follow yeah, up but yes. yeah i i agree with you astrid like it's 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 both ways mm -hmm. but sometimes i see 
the wording that is used. For instance, if you speak of my biological father, I find it problematic in a way because fatherhood is also something very social. And I see sometimes donors using this kind of, and I can understand it, but in a way, I don't want to go that way. Like that is that fatherhood is, but I'm so like people are saying, I'm missing half of my identity. Um, I'm missing my biological father. It's an overemphasis on genetics. Um, and this is why it is so important to ask people, why do you use that word? Because pe sometimes people will use donor, donor dad, biological dad, biological father. I don't know. I mean, there's so many words. And if you ask people, why do you use, trying to explain me, what does it mean to you? Then it goes beyond this father, I'm looking for a father role or someone who's taking care of me or, um, and I think that's missing. We do pick up on words and that sometimes creates confusion and misinterpretation of each other. Yeah, 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 I, I, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. If I can perhaps shortly, but you can already pass the microphone to Tina. <laughs> I think, for example, for donor siblings, there's a nice new word, I think, diplings, which is, I think, uh, nice in, in terminology to make that difference between, you know, we are not really siblings, but we're donor siblings. So it's, uh, I think we have to be perhaps also creative about a new name for donors that is a bit nicer than donors, but not as um, emotionally laden as, as father, I'm not sure. But I'll pass on the word to Tine. Yeah, I have a, a question which maybe is about methodology, but this is an interdisciplinary event. Uh, and I just wonder, how does a philosopher come to the conclusion that someone overvalues something? Because when I go and interview people, I never try to judge, I only try to understand. And I just wonder, as a philosopher, how do you come to say that, you know, some people overvalue or overemphasize genetics? How many times do I have? <laughs> Two minutes and 47 seconds. <laughs> I would, I, I agree with you. So I also did qualitative research and it's first important step that we just start listening without judging people. But again, I think it's also important to be critical and not just accept everything that people say. And then you can dig deeper in the literature and see that there are social mechanisms in this society. And now I'm going very directly, but then you can make statements more on a normative level. Because if you can say we cannot say anything normative, I would completely not agree. But we need to start with listening and then take a more critical lens. Uh, otherwise we have like ethics by opinion poll. So, Michiel, yeah, I'm, I'm also a philosopher. I'm also a feminist philosopher. <laughs> we know each other very well, eh? but, <laughs> and we had this discussion already. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree. On the one hand, as a philosopher, as an ethicist, you can take normative positions. You can say, for example, I personally do not believe in that biological essentialist narrative. I find it problematic, and of course, you are right to do so. That's your job. Um, on the other hand, when you are dealing with people. Um, there are also certain values that um, you need to respect in a way that you know you cannot impose your vision of the good life on everybody. And that's a very central principle in uh, ethics. So I think in this case, um, it is indeed problematic to impose your view of what you think is the good life or what is the truth on uh, other people while they should have the right to decide for themselves whether that they find it important or not. And uh, situation is that we live in a society that indeed is both mixed in that area, it's both those social constructivist views of identity and there are biological views on identity. There is no scientific evidence yet to say that we cannot say at all that biology doesn't matter. We cannot prove that. The consensus is more that there's an overlap between nature and nurture. So both these narratives are around in our society, people attach importance to that, and we should give them the space to express them and to attach importance to the way they want to construct their identity. And I think it's very problematic to try to impose your view of what is good on them. <laughs> but, Shortly. But, <laughs> but I agree with that. But I don't know what the good life is. We need to talk about it and debate it. I don't have a fixed definition of truth. So what am I imposing? No, I think we need to be care. We need to be careful. 
and to, and then we can use that to construct together in a way but it's also very philosophical what is a good life i don't know it <laughs> Can we perhaps, on a reconciliatory note, <laughs> say that if uh, if a donor conceived child and a donor or two donor siblings both very much value a genetic link and they find each other through sibling registries, or that that's not problematic if they're on the same page, but that perhaps it's problematic if one person values genetic connection a lot and the other one does not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can I? That's just a little. No, thing. we're out of time for your. Another uh, complete social oh. construct. <laughs> Michiel? Yes, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to pass on the microphone <laughs> to the next speaker, uh, Elodie de Corte. Uh, she brought uh, a statement for us uh, from a legal perspective. Everyone has the right to know their genetic origin. So if you agree that everyone has the right to know their genetic origin, that is green. If you do not agree that everyone has the right to know their genetic origin, that is red and orange is in between. Online, I see a lot of green popping up. Also here, I see a lot of green. I see one brave person with orange. <laughs> um, so, uh, and also online, there's a second person, uh, uh, two other persons who are uh, in doubt. So what are your view on this? Yes, so I will talk about donor anonymity from a legal uh, perspective. So as we already heard um, in the beginning in the Belgium fertility clinics today, they are legally obliged to make all information about the donor uh, inaccessible to donor conceived persons and there are no uh, exceptions. Uh, but this traditional model of uh, anonymous donation, it is challenged, as we already heard, I think. So first by the evolution of genetic technology, and then I mean that uh, everyone can access DNA tests. So the donor anonymity can still be legally protected, but de facto it can no longer be um, guaranteed. Um, there are also changes in uh, society. It's more and more uh, recognized that it's important to know your genetic origins for uh, personal development or for your identity uh, building. And last, there is also, it's challenged by human rights and I will focus uh, on that one. So on an um, international and a European uh, level, we see that the emphasis has gradually shifted towards rights and interests of the donor conceived persons. And I give, can give some examples. So uh, first in 2019, we have the Council of Europe that stated in a recommendation that um, yeah, anonymity should be abolished for all future donations and that the use of anonymous donations should be prohibited in all the member states, so including in uh, Belgium. Then we also have the CRC, that's the Convention of the Rights of the Children, and that gives all the children the right to, to know their parents and the right to identity. And of course, these rights apply to all children, so also to the uh, donor-conceived uh, children. And then last, we have um, the European Court of Human Rights, um, which states that knowing your genetic parentage is an integral part of the notion of uh, your private life. So it is protected under Article 8. And the court also states that um, every person has a vital interest in knowing its genetic origins and also that that vital interest does not uh, disappear with age. So if you're young or old, it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter according to the court. So, and we also see that this whole uh, evolution is reflected in many uh, other European uh, countries that have already abolished donor anonymity. So they grant donor conceived persons access to information like the identity, how the donor looks, what his motivations are for donating. Uh, but Belgium, yeah, stays a bit behind. Um, of course, this right to know your genetic origins, that's not an, uh, it's not an absolute right. So we need to balance it against the other interests that are involved. But the current situation in Belgium of absolute anonymity, of course, you can feel that's not a fair balance because it does not take into account the interests of the donor conceived persons to access information about their donors. So Belgium should adopt a new legal framework granting these donor conceived persons access um, to information. And in the last years, uh, there have been several proposals um, admitted to Parliament, but so far without uh, any avail. But there are indeed different uh, solutions to design this new legal framework. So we see that some proposals give all the donor conceived persons access to information, but 
sometimes under certain um, conditions like age restrictions. Um, and then we have the other proposals who uh, want to um, create different types of donors. So going from absolute anonymity to uh, full disclosure of information. But at least from a legal perspective, that is difficult. Um, and I think it will not pass the review of the constitutional court because it creates different children with different rights and yet our constitution protects the rights uh, of equality and non-discrimination. And of course, also important, these proposals are for the future. Uh, and yeah, of course, we also have the past. So when a new system will be introduced, we always have to wonder to which um, situations will the old uh, system of donor anonymity continue to apply and to which uh, situations will the new law of access to donor information uh, apply. And the principle in Belgium and also in, in uh, other countries is non-retroactivity. So that means that laws are only for the future, not for the past. That is important to preserve the legal certainty. Of course, that also implies that the current donors will be able to remain their uh, anonymity. But that does not have to mean that the current donor-conceived persons will all be uh, left out in the cold with nothing because there are different degrees of retroactivity possible. Um, for example, granting some information like non-identifying information or uh, even the identity with the consent, for example, of uh, the donor. Yeah, thank okay. you. Um, anybody who wants to reply immediately or, or yeah, go ahead, Michiel. Uh, I know this, this is going to be controversial. Oh, not again, uh, Michiel. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what do you think? And it's not my own view completely, but uh, there is the argument made in the literature, like um, if we ban anonymity, there will be a decrease in, in donors. Mm -hmm. And maybe there we get a kind of conflict also on the social justice level, because if you think about access to reproductive technologies and the people who can use it, like LGBTQI people, um, what do you think of that kind of statement? Like if we ban anonymity completely, there will be a decrease in, in donors. It's not sure the evidence is uh, in a way ambiguous, um, but what do you think of that argument? Do we actually have a conflict of rights uh, in that way? Yeah, of course, uh, as you already said, that's not completely sure if that's true. The numbers say something else. It's not because you add donor anonymity, there will be less donors. Because in Belgium, there is also a shortage, even if we, we still protect the anonymity of the donor. So I think there are more, there's more than that. But indeed, like I said, you need to take into account all the interests. I mean, the interests of the donor, the parents, the child, and also uh, generally the, the society, the access to, uh, but I don't think... Um, because the, the right of the child should always be the primary consideration that's based on the CRC, on the convention and also on the constitution. So I don't think that having um, yeah, a large access for everyone can go above the, the interest of the child to, to access their information. So the goal should not be to have as many donors as possible, uh, but to have donors, but also respecting the rights of everyone involved, so including these donor-conceived persons. So I definitely, it should be in the, the, the balance and the new law, maybe by doing some um, advertisement, maybe that's a wrong thing to say uh, <laughs> like that, but uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I think it's not allowed in Belgium <laughs> to well, advertise. The, the law has, uh, indeed, it's not allowed, but there is a new change, so it will be more easy for fertility clinics to um, advertise, because in the past, indeed, it was only possible if it was a general, so not for your clinic personal, yeah. but now they will... Um, but of course, as always in Belgium, you have the law, but you need um, the yeah, uitvoerend besluit. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The... And that is not there yet. So. No, yeah. And the donors actually went up, Michiel, in France, which was the last country yes. to abolish so... donor anonymity. But then they had a lot more women, uh, lesbian and single moms who also went. So, But I think Astrid wants to uh, respond. Well, I'm happy, Heidi, that you mentioned it because it's... it's um... Well, you said it yourself. It's very controversial, um, but it's one of, of the, the use of empirical um, research or data in uh, a not complete way. 
but it takes its own life. I mean, it, it goes or it doesn't take its own life. It goes its own uh, its own life in the sense that um, we do create fear that there are less donors, that there will be a shortage of donors. Well, there always have been a shortage of donors. There is just a huge increase in demand for uh, donors as well. And I think that's never um, added to the discussion. And if we look at the numbers, I mean, if, if donors will be asked, will you donate after the anonymity is abolished? A lot of them will say no, but never in such a questionnaire is explained, okay, if donor anonymity is abolished, how would that function? What would that mean if you would be identified? Well, uh, will there be some mediating um, institution or institution organization that will help you to connect and to exchange information and in what way, you know, you don't need to have contact. There are different ways of, of exchanging information. So if I don't know what it uh, all, all the consequences are, I would say no as well, which is kind of an obvious uh, intelligent answer, I would say. Um, so it's also how we ask P um, the donors, you know, would you still donate in a system that would look like this? with all these kinds of elements with it. We also see that donors, previously anonymous donors, do step out of anonymity if information is given to them. How would that um, information exchange between a donor and a donor-conceived person uh, would go? What help or support is, is there? Um, so yeah, just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you. And, and adding maybe to Elodie as well, the retroactive, Again, there has been very controversial about it, as it seemed that um, all the anonymity was waved away. When um, this is referring to Australia, um, Victoria State, um, donors could say and give a veto as well and say, okay, no, this is too much, or I would be willing to just um, exchange information via email or um, whatever. So again, it was more nuanced than it was um, presented in the media. Yeah, thank you. Can I, yeah, go ahead, Sophie. Yes, I just have a question actually uh, for uh, you, Elodie. Um, so uh, I think it's very convincing uh, the, yeah, the evidence you give that this right is international being recognized, but why exactly is it that Belgium is lagging behind? Do you have any idea why this takes so long? Like, what is behind this? <laughs> You know, added to this because it's, it's related, I have also always wondered about the Belgian law of 2007. You know, many countries in Europe were already waiving anonymity and we embraced it as a country. Mm -hmm. How did this happen? Uh, do you have a, a reflection? Yeah, in 2007, I wasn't there, of course, when the discussion happened, but when I read the um, the, the history of the law. There was indeed already discussion about it, um, but the arguments against um, openness, they, they won because there was a fear of, uh, especially that there would be not enough donors. Uh, and the other fear was that they would not want to discriminate between children from before who would not be able to know their donor and uh, the children. So that's a very, silly argument of course because when you change the law you always make a cut in time so that's not an um, so those were the main uh, arguments and some some uh, so yeah it's strange because uh, indeed there was already uh, the netherlands the uk they already decided to abolish anonymity why is it still today i think there is already an agreement that something has to change but it still takes a lot of long time because they cannot agree on um, how they are going to change. As I said, there are many ways to design the framework and some want the system with dif different donors, like the donor can choose if he wants to be anonymous, if he wants to be an open identity and others just want to have one donor profile. And, and I think this is the, because mm. political, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, but I don't think there's any political party that would support no, mandatory no, anonymity like, all over the board now. No, no, that's no. definitely... Um, yeah, and also I would like to uh, add that indeed, the, um, maybe to... to because not everyone always know, knows, but as a donor in Belgium, you are protected against legal um, demands. Eh? So when you donate your sperm in a clinic, 
you will not be the legal father. That's not possible. So, um, and also for the parents, it's also guaranteed that they will be the legal parents. So that's maybe sometimes a story people have. I will not donate or I don't want to be known because then they will ask me um, yeah, more than, than I want, but that's um, yeah. already framed in the, in the law. law. Yeah. So, Can I ask you one, one last question? Yes. <laughs> because you said the constitutional court will probably not allow different systems, but don't we also have that today? Now we also have people that know their parents and people or know their genetic uh, ancestry and people that don't, and there hasn't been a challenge in the constitutional court. So why would this um, be different You mean now? people in general? Like when you don't know Well, both within the group of donor-conceived people, the, the ones the with known. the known donors and the not, but also just in society. The... Yeah, I, I would like with, indeed you can bring your own donor to the fertility clinic, so then it's um, known, but it's actually not for the child because you have to rely on the willingness of the donor of the parents, because according to the law, fertility clinics can never give any information to the child, even yeah. if it's a known donor. So yeah. pure legally, it, it, there is no but right. But that would remain the same, right? Or, or is there anyone suggesting that they will call children at 18 to say, hello, your donor conceived? I hope not. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, That's even okay. if your parents used a known donor, you cannot go to the fertility clinics to ask information about that donor. No, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's this difference then now as well between the two categories, but it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll, we have to move on because we're out of okay. time. Uh, so we have Astrid, uh, who is left online with the last uh, statement. And the statement that Astrid brought was, donor conceived people who search have psychological problems. So if you agree that donor conceived people who search for their donor have psychological problems, that's green. If you do not agree that they have psychological problems, that's red. And if you're in doubt, that's orange. And the room is huh, very orangey today, I would say for this one and red online. Also, I see a lot of red, orange, and a little bit of green. Um, Okay, so I will give the words to Astrid. Okay. Um, I've heard so much today, and I must say, I, I really will try to keep my COVID brain um, focused um, on it, what I wanted to say. So why this um, quote? It is probably correct and not correct, um, in the sense that there will be donor-conceived people who, who have... Um, troubles with being donor conceived uh, or other um, issues who search but and this is the main point I actually wanted to make there are also findings showing that donor conceived people who um, have a very positive well-being and um, appreciate their family well functioning as very well who still show an interest in um, in the donor or in their ancestry information and this is actually what very often ha happens with um, the psychological research that is only one part is mentioned and that some other um, um, findings of uh, the research is actually uh, not mentioned or remained underexposed. The consequence of it, if we would read the statement, don't conceive people who search have psychological problems, it's often put in, in debates or in the media. Um, it's only people who discovered late, who were very unhappy, um, who have bad relationships with their parents who um, search. Um, oftenly added that it's only a minor group that experiences this and, and this should not be the reason to change, um, to change the law. So the risk is that we give a very narrow view and um, actually an incorrect image on the experiences of donor conceived um, people. And it also problematizes um, the experiences of donor conceived people because it seems that um, showing interest in, in your donor is a sign of a problem while actually others who show an interest in their ancestry and all these million people on ancestry.com or whatever, they have a perfectly normal interest in their ancestry. And so what the, and this is going to be like a summary in, in a half a minute, is what we see in the research is that 
um, there's so many vari variables that um, have an impact or play a role in interest or not. And that could be, we see that more women are interested than men, but could also be that less men are participating in research as well. Um, depending on the age, depending on the context of family type, we see that donor conceived people in solo mother families with an identifiable donor is actually the largest group that is interested in the donor. Um, so all these kinds of people have different motivations. It's not because they want to search for a parent or a father or a mother, but because of identity or narratives or, or all different kinds of motivations. Um, what's also important, and that's what happens when we only narrow down the research and not look at a complete what's, what's going on in the research field, there are also parents who are interested in information about the donors, not only donor conceived um, people, there are also donors who are interested in the offspring that are, are a result of their uh, donation. And what we do is kind of always opposite as um, parent, uh, donor conceived uh, people, opposite parents, opposite donors, um, which in the research, the data doesn't show that if you would take the effort to kind of put the research um, together. Another part, and that's a, a little bit a tricky part of research, it's a one moment in time. Most of the research is a one moment in time um, survey or a question or an interview. Uh, during my PhD, I interviewed people um, at the end of the pregnancy, at uh, three months after birth and two years after birth. I had people, parents saying, very convinced in the beginning, saying, oh, absolutely, anonymous donor. It's actually not a human. It's, I see it as blood. And that person changed his view or opinion about the donor um, because he became a parent and he put his own fears behind. Uh, he wanted to be there for their child and put the needs of their child first. And now he would um, vote for abolishing donor anonymity. So people can change a process and, and that's very little taken into account. If people say, no, I'm not interested in donor information, that's fine. And it could stay the rest of their life, but it could change in two years, in, in 50 years. Um, and that's something that's very little present. Um, as, as a psychologist and as a researcher, of course, I value research very much because it gives voice to um, the experiences of all those involved. But we need to be very careful how we use it in an ethical debate. Um, and, and we should be aware that um, the best, I think the best approach is, and that's not always easy, to, to work with reviews, because mentioning only one study is in one study and, and gives a very narrow view. We should also be then aware, why do we mention certain data and other data not? Because that says something about our interpretation of the data um, as well. Of course, there are limitations to the research because I know it's very often set qualitative research, only a few people and quantitative should be better. It's just a different approach to gathering information about it. And still some data, if it's collected, you know, if it's, it's gathered in a, in a research good qualitative way, is better than no data and only um, working on theoretically um, assumptions. Um, and so I think that's my um, main main uh, point to make today. Um, it's much more complex. Um, it's not so opposite as we think it is or it is presented. Um, and the other thing is that empirical research shows what is, not what ought to be. Um, I think that's the difference um, yeah. as well to make. Okay, thank you. Any of our panel members who want to respond? Yes, Sophie? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Astrid. And uh, yeah, I actually immediately had to think about uh, uh, much adoption research uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, especially, but even now you find some. Um, but there was indeed like a similar 
proliferation of research in why do adoptee search and indeed a strong tendency to pathologize that to look for problematic relations with the adoptive parents uh, or to try to find mental <laughs> issues and of course all that failed and the more recent conclusions are now well those profiles are just so diverse that you just cannot pinpoint the reason why some people search and, and others don't um, so I hope that we can indeed leave the, that question behind and just accept that uh, well it's very normal that people would, would want to know effects about themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the obsession with this question was mostly because it was seen as a problem, not for the, those children, but for the parents, uh, or even for the, the, the whole sector invested in secrecy, um, that it's of course threatening if uh, the children start searching. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, but I also agree with you indeed that uh, uh, it's also not so opposite, uh, also not in a adoption as is often uh, assumed. There are also many adoptive parents who have become aware of problems in adoption who also are very supportive of more openness and of uh, assisting and supporting their children also in their search. Uh, so yeah, that definitely gives hope for the future. Yeah, thank you. Any other panel members want to respond? Otherwise, perhaps I have a small question for you, Astrid. So you mentioned people can change their mind. And I think this has been described uh, before. Uh, people beforehand, they're afraid of this donor invading their family. But then when the child is there, they have a good relationship. They think, you know, it'll be fine. How do you think we should look at a donor changing uh, his or her opinion? So, for example, if we would shift to um, uh, ID uh, release donors, so say that I donate at a young age and I think, oh, it'll be good that I get to know this person. But then 18 years later, I'm in my 40s and I, I have a family and I think, oh, actually, I'm a bit afraid of this person um, contacting me. How do you think we should manage that? Well, I think, again, it's about um, counseling donors as well. Of course, I know counseling um now and 18 years later remembering what is counseled or what is set at that moment is is a huge um there's a huge time difference and and probably you can't imagine what it all or what all the implications are um what we know is that mediation or um just support um is very valuable and again a lot of misinformation the information that there is the knock at the door of a donor conceived ch um, child i have so many examples of i've even uh, we've got examples of donor conceived people who have found their donor on the online um, DNA um, genetic testing, consumer testing, and then asked a mediating organization, can you contact the donor? Um, because they don't want to be too um, direct. Um, they are loyal to their parents. They know that they're um, um, in some way intruding um, in another family. Maybe that person hasn't um, informed the partner yet their children because his children are um, genetically related to the donor conceived person as well. And I think um, having the view or the, knowing that you can have some control on the pace of the process as well, that you can say, okay, we start with an email or uh, what is actually wanted? What does this person want from me? Are expectations a bit in the same line? Um, and that there is some support will help. That That's our experiences or the experiences that I had um, in the Netherlands. Um, but there is often that the donor conceived offspring stands at my door and, and and this is what's you know presented in movies as well. Um, all of a sudden, you open the door, and that's not the reality. Or um, they're searching for a parent. No, they're not searching for a parent. Um, they want money. No, I've, we have. There is no claim in the world of um, money that a donor can see offspring um, is asking from from the donor. And so, I think um, helping giving the correct information and support in how this. Um, exchange of information if that is contact online via email or direct contact is also kind of a um, something that can be looked at yeah yeah because we have many foreign donors as well of course so there it'll be more likely be online contact I guess yeah. any other questions or um, Astrid yeah thank you um, I liked that you ended with like this uh, typical philosophical uh, question of the is art uh, gap, but I think it's also important in, in this uh, debate 
because uh, as you said uh, sometimes ethicists use uh, empirical uh, material a little bit limited and that we need to look at diverse uh, voices and studies that are around but i think also the other way around sometimes people who are doing only empirical work are making too fast um, normative judgments but the solution is in a way to work better together and to and as this panel is a, an illustration of that we need more interdisciplinary dialogue between ethicists uh, psychologists uh, people who are working in law uh, to, to create a better dialogue which is in the end a normative uh, thing but uh, i like that uh, as, as your answer any other questions for astrid and the panel no, perhaps I can ask another one. Then. <laughs> I think uh, I saw a study, and it might actually be yours, Astrid, but I'm not sure. It might be also from a Swedish group um, of uh, people who have met um, the the donor or donor siblings, but and how they how they view each other, um, and a, a pretty large group. I think it was about how do you see it was about donor and the children. Um, how do you see them? Do you see them more as uh, 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 a, a daughter or a son or as a just um, someone you you know you know or you know and, and in Guinness we would say in, in Dutch or, or as yeah. a friend or and there is a there is a quite a large group that would say well I, I look at them as it was donors towards children I think I look at them as somehow my children I think not completely the same as their own children but somehow as my child should we like as a counselor should we try to say, well, you know, be careful, it's not really your child, or, or should we leave room for that? Or how should we navigate it if people start think, looking at it that way? Yeah, I think, again, it's it's um, asking, why do you call it a child? Genetically, it, it is a child. I'm, I mean, it, yeah. the person, through his donation, he, he did not have sex with the woman, but through his donation and genes, the child was born. So genetically, he's the father and um, the donor conceived offspring is the child from him. Um, I hear often that they see as well the children of my friends. And I think, um, it, and I think it was Sophie who said it before, the, the, it's often the emotion of the threatening the, oh, we hear that they call him child. Ooh, are you claiming it's my child? Um, or, ooh, they say, father, are you claiming I'm not a father anymore? Um, so I think it's really important to, why do we call, there is a lack, again, there is a lack of words um, that how to, to describe. Um, and we should question much more, why are we so much threatened by it? What does it scare us? Is it um, because someone, um, do we assume that he will claim the child then, that he has certain um, thoughts about responsibility or values to the child? Or I think we need to ask, more. and and this is what's now the stage in research that, okay, we know that um, a lot of people or some people are searching, others not, um, and contact is made and relationships, and I'm carefully in my word, um, relationships meaning that more than one contact, cont ongoing contact is going on and people are searching themselves how to give meaning to that relationship. What is it? It's not a child, it's not a nephew or a niece, it's, but still I kind of contrib contributed, should I be, um, somehow feel a responsibility or not because the people that the child children I'm connect genetically connected to in my family I have responsibilities to so people are just donors are trying to figure out um how to work with this and we should not forget that often in sperm banks donors are kind of counsel just as a donation point end of it don't think about it um I mean people need help as well to create to think about it and how they will give meaning to it okay thank you my alarm went off so we're uh, we finished the 15 minutes for this statement which means that i'm perfectly on time i'm very happy <laughs> for questions from the audience um, so if there are people in the audience here or online perhaps it's easiest if you type your question in the chat um, uh, and then I will um, 